Every now and then, an aircraft comes along that redefines the standards from which all future types would be built. In the case of American bomber design in the 1930s, this would come in the form of the Martin B-10. By the end of the previous decade, America's bomber force was starting to not only look outdated, but unable to fulfil the requirements of a rapidly evolving air force. All operational bombers were the tried and tested but slow biplane designs, most of which were members of the Keystone series, and these were quickly showing their obsolescence. Sleek monoplane designs were already starting to appear in the commercial aviation sector, particularly in Europe, but these had thus far struggled to gain favour in many military circles. Though the benefits of the monoplane had been demonstrated, the US Army and Navy still required all military planes to be built as biplanes. This was partly due to old school conservatism, and partly because it was thought that their reliability made them cheaper. In actuality, the monoplane had become cheaper to both fly and maintain by 1929, but senior officers at the time didn't like being told that they were wrong. Eventually, and sometimes with great reluctance, it was accepted that the monoplane was the future, and the Army Air Corps began seeking designs for a new monoplane bomber. This quickly resulted in the development of several experimental aircraft. Douglas came up with the Gullwing Dex B-7, Fokker developed the short-lived XB-8, and Boeing seemed to be the strongest contender when they produced the YB-9. All of these were an improvement on previous biplane models, but each design was a compromise of old thinking with new technology. Watching this from afar, Martin began work on a private venture of their own. They had previously built bombers for the Army Air Corps, notably the successful MB-2 of the mid-1920s, and they now worked on a design not only to beat the competition, but render them totally obsolete. The prototype, designated as the Model 123, was a rapid departure from anything Martin had developed before. It was a sleek, all-metal, cantilever mid-wing monoplane of advanced construction, the wing was built in three sections, a centre section built into the fuselage, which carried the two engine nacelles and the leading edge, and two detachable outer sections. All of these had a structure of riveted aluminium with stressed steel fittings, and the whole lot was covered in a sleek stressed aluminium skin. Like the wing, the all-metal fuselage was also built in three sections, however its metal skin had a different arrangement. The sides of the fuselage were covered in a smooth skin of stressed aluminium to deal with the sheer loads during flight, whereas the top and bottom of the fuselage was clad in corrugated skin that could better handle compression loads. Unlike previous bomber designs, which usually carried their drag-inducing bombs under the wing or the fuselage, the Model 123 was the first to contain the entirety of its bomb load in an internal bomb bay. This was not only a practical innovation, but one for safety as well, as carrying fused bombs within the plane usually had better safety margins than those stored externally. It also allowed the bombardier control of when the bombs would be armed, depending on the bomb type and fuse. Another featured innovation was the provision for a mechanically retractable landing gear, which again was done for the sake of streamlining. However, like the internal bomb bay, this would come at the cost of added weight, and as such, the bomber would be equipped with a pair of 600 horsepower Wright SR1820 Cyclone engines. Keeping up with the trend, this too was an innovation, as the Cyclone was still in its earliest stages of development, and its successful use in the Martin prototype was a contributing factor in it being used for many other aircraft of fame later on in its life. The prototype was completed and delivered to the Army on March the 20th, 1932, who upon receiving it sent the plane to Wright Field for evaluation. At this point, the aircraft was given the new designation of XB907. In its completed form, it had a wingspan of just over 62 feet, and with a new pair of streamlined engine cowlings, it was expected to achieve a top speed of at least 190 miles an hour. Depending on what source is cited, it either had a crew of three or four. The point of debate is whether the prototype initially had provision for a co-pilot or not, as it was later removed for the production model. Regardless of number, all of the crew positions were open to the elements in this first design, which, considering the hoped-for top speeds, would have made for a frigid experience on that crisp March morning in central Ohio. 
Frozen pilots aside, the prototype performed better than expected during its first flights. Not only did it take off and land in a shorter distance than expected, courtesy of modern split flaps, but it also reached a top speed of 197 miles an hour at 6,000 feet. In light of these promising figures, the prototype was sent back for modifications in the autumn to further improve its capabilities. The nose went through an extensive redesign, which included the fitting of the first enclosed gun turret to ever be found on a US military aircraft. This turret was manually rotated by the gunner and featured a single 30 caliber Browning machine gun. Though it did somewhat reduce pilot visibility for takeoff and landing, it was believed that this was offset by the nose gunner themselves, who, in a pinch, could provide visual guidance. Though I can't imagine that would have been a particularly fun affair for anyone involved, especially in poor weather. Other modifications included the change from the shorter town ring cowlings to the more encompassing NACA units, an upgrade in engine to the newer 675 horsepower version of the Cyclone, and the widening of the wingspan by a further 8 feet. Though all of this added another 2,000 pounds to the total weight of the aircraft, it performed even better when it returned to Wright Field in October 1932, reaching a new top speed of 207 miles an hour. As a result of its outstanding performance, the Army Air Corps placed a production order for 48 bombers and purchased the original prototype, redesignating it as the XB-10. Between that moment and the first deliveries of the production B-10s, some additional changes were made to the overall design. It was accepted, and in no small part thanks to some very vocal complaints, that a plane flying over 200 miles an hour should not have open crew stations, and so the pilot's cockpit and rear gunner station were finally enclosed. The number of crew was also reduced to three at this point, and the weight saved by ditching the co-pilot was used to allow the installation of radio equipment that would be used by the rear gunner. Various engine installations were made to the 48 units delivered for the initial production order. The first 14 aircraft, designated as the YB-10, had a similar version of the Cyclone engine that powered the first prototype, and thus their overall performance was very similar. Most of the production order would be powered by a more powerful version, giving out 775 horsepower, and these units would be delivered as the B-10B. There was also an experimental model, the YB-10A. This featured turbo-supercharged versions of the engine that gave it an impressive top speed of 236 miles an hour at 25,000 feet. However, for various reasons, mostly due to cost, only one of these would be built. When it finally entered service, the B-10 was faster than any fighter currently operated by the US military, and its advanced performance rendered all other bomber designs obsolete overnight. Domestically, they would serve with numerous air groups, both as a conventional bomber, but also in some auxiliary roles. In January of 1931, the Army Air Corps assumed responsibility for coastal defence around the US mainland. This was the source of considerable grumbling, as this task had been the cherished prerogative of the US Navy and the decision was made to adapt several models of the YB and B-10 into the YB-12. These aquatic conversions usually entailed the fitting of large floats for water use, but for the northern regions there was also the use of a ski and wheel landing gear arrangement. Aside from this particular task, the B-10 sometimes found itself involved in events that caught the general eye of the public as well. A notable example of this occurred in 1936, when a group of B-10s were used to drop much-needed supplies to island communities in the Chesapeake Bay. These islands had been cut off after a particularly nasty winter storm, which had iced up the bay to such a degree that sending in supplies by ship was impossible. In response to a request by the Red Cross, the 49th Bomb Group sent in several B-6 and B-10 bombers for a resupply mission. Landing directly on the islands was deemed too dangerous, and so the planes conducted the supply equivalent of a bombing run, sometimes dropping their supplies from a height of just 15 feet above the ground. The B-10s made headlines again later that spring, when a flight of nine aircraft made several long-distance flights from Virginia to the Panama Canal. Though this was not done in one single leg, with stops in Miami and Costa Rica, it did much to display the projection of US air power. As a result of its success, the B-10 was approved to be sold for export once Martin's delivery contracts for the Army had been completed, 
and in August of 1936, an example of the B-10 was demonstrated to foreign buyers as the Model 139W. Unsurprisingly, Martin found several customers who were very keen to purchase. Eventually, models would be sold to Argentina, China, the Netherlands, the Soviet Union, Thailand, and Turkey. Most of these units were exported as various versions of the Model 139. In general, they were very similar, with the main difference usually being a change in power plant. The two biggest export customers for the B-10 were Argentina and the Netherlands. Argentina would eventually operate 39 aircraft across its army and navy, and the Netherlands would operate 121. They would also be the only customer for the updated version of the export model, dubbed the 166. This model was of the same basic design as the 139, but it featured a notable change to the cockpit layout. Instead of a separate pilot's cockpit and rear gunner station, it now featured a long glass house style canopy. Along with this, the nose and front turret fairing were modified to improve streamlining, and the provision was made for additional bombs to be carried under the wing between the engines and the fuselage. By the time the B-10s actually saw combat, there were already aircraft in production that surpassed them. However, because the B-10 was so much of a leap forward compared to previous bomber designs, the export models saw extensive use as they often still outclassed the aircraft operated against them. They got their trial by fire in 1937, when five Chinese-operated B-10s were flown on bombing raids against Japanese ground forces around Shanghai and Nanking. Though their speed made them effective, they were fielded in too few numbers to make a large impact, and by the end of 1938, all of them had either been destroyed or damaged beyond repair. The remaining combat experience of the B-10 was mostly found in the service of Thailand and the Dutch East Indies, the latter forces seeing extensive operations against the invading forces of Imperial Japan. Operations varied between coastal patrol, anti-submarine efforts, and high-altitude bombing. Dutch-operated B-10s were sometimes used for low-altitude missions as well, but a mix of strong Japanese anti-aircraft fire and some unfortunate friendly fire incidents soon put an end to that particular tactic. Though it was a losing battle, the B-10s played their part in holding up the Japanese invasion as best they could, especially when it came to the defense of Sumatra. As the end drew near, many of them would be used for reconnaissance duties to spot incoming Japanese attacks thanks to their high speed. But by the end of 1942, Java was almost completely surrounded. Several B-10s were shot down by Japanese fighters, many more were destroyed on the ground, and the few remaining models were either captured or scrapped after the Allied forces had surrendered. Back home, the B-10 would remain in service with Army Bombardment Squadrons until the arrival of the B-17 and B-18 in the late 1930s. During this time, an attempt was made to build on the success of the B-10 and design a competitor against the new bombers. The Model 146 could easily be considered a fatter, albeit more powerful, version of the B-10, but in reality, it also featured a lot of brand new components. Besides being designed with a much longer range than the B-10, it also featured improved engines, fowler flaps, and a new cockpit that once again allowed for a co-pilot. Though it was ultimately a failure, the Model 146, along with its more successful forebear, taught the designers at Martin many valuable lessons. But surprisingly, despite over 340 being built, only a single example of the B-10 survives today. It's an export model, originally operated by Argentina, and it can now be found at the National Museum of the US Air Force in Ohio. By the time the last B-10s were retired, having served the Royal Thai Air Force until 1949, they had left a lasting legacy of the plane that reinvented American bomber design. Traces of the B-10's design can be seen in many famous US aircraft that were operated during the Second World War, and it directly influenced the design of Martin's next, and perhaps most famous, fast bomber, the B-26 Marauder. But that's a story for another day. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.